Welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. And this time I'm going to be doing a redo of a painting I did in Kyoto, Japan this past November. Uh, we are in the city of Kyoto painting for six days uh, in November, the height of autumn, and the leaves and the foliage are just spectacular. The motif for the scene is this picture set in Shirakawa Gion, which is in an old section of Japan. And uh, the architecture, uh, the gardens, the layout is st still has a classic Japanese feel to it, and that very much plays in today's piece. Along with uh, the many uh, people who were wearing kimonos, actually, and walking the streets, um, this was not arranged by anybody. It's just um, a common thing now in Kyoto is to see people uh, renting a kimono and walking in the older streets of Gion uh, in Kyoto. And this happened to be a very striking motif for tourists such as myself who don't get to see this so often. Uh, the kimono and the um, background just work perfectly together. So in this painting, I'm going to be working with a underpainting, and that's what you see me working on now. I'm using a yellow ochre, uh, cad red orange, um, some cad yellow, and I'm working very much wet into wet, trying to generate a bright underpainting. My intention is to follow this with a darker, grayer color and by doing this kind of emphasize the bright pattern of the autumn leaves that we saw in the photograph. And against all this is a couple dressed in the kimono. So uh, in this piece uh, generating a lot of color working wet into wet you can see it's all soft edges and very um, kind of vague shapes but the underpainting is important, as you'll see in the final piece, to create um, this glowing warm light that comes through the shadows. And uh, that's what I'm going to be playing on in the next um, section. So the painting has had a chance to dry. And now I'm starting with, uh, with brush strokes at the top, painting some of the background, which it would be the structures uh, behind the fall foliage. Uh, it's a complex pattern that we're creating here. Part of it is background, part of it is uh, leaves in the foreground, and part of it is luminous leaves kind of sandwiched between the two. So this is a description of what we're seeing, how to recreate that uh, using watercolor presented a challenge, and I'm going to use uh, a lot of splattering of paint to generate this random pattern pattern of uh, leaves against the background. Um, mostly with this gray that I've mixed from uh, ultramarine blue and a little bit of burnt sienna. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything. In fact, I'm very much concentrating on the left, uh, the remaining yellow that you see being exposed as a result of the uh, painting the background. The shape and pattern that I'm trying to create is, is important to this painting. And so I'm careful about uh, the spaces between these yellow shapes. I'm careful about the angles and how they move towards the subject. I'm thinking uh, at the same time to create a feeling of randomness to it. So a lot is going through the painter's mind when they're generating this apparently kind of free free placement of shapes and um, colors. I'm actually trying to structure it and trying to um, guide it so that it works for my composition. So you can see uh, after painting the gray I'm again splattering with a darker color. This mixture is more cad red, a bit of alizarin mixed uh, into that gray and this is going to kind of come to the foreground a little bit. It's going to push back against the yellow 
And as I said earlier, it's going to sandwich this yellow in between a feeling of foreground and background and hopefully create uh, the glowing leaves that we were enchanted by in our uh, autumn visit to Kyoto. We saw this everywhere in the temples, uh, in the gardens, uh, not only uh, in Gion. Well, it's starting to assume a, a sort of finished quality to the background. And when I see this in my painting, I, I try to pause. I try to step back and say, okay, how much more of this do we need to do? How much more is going to be helpful? And usually I, I try to stop um, at this point and move to the next section. The next section is going to be uh, working down in the lower third of the painting, creating the fence, um, which is again is going to kind of push back against uh, this very animated background, push it towards the back. And I'm really counting on the placement and strength of the figures to do the same thing, to kind of push back against all this chaotic brushwork and very animated uh, quality to the background. It's important, but it's also important to kind of uh, settle that energy with something on top of it. So I'm going to go for the fence now using a stronger mix of cad orange red and a bit of alizarin and uh, perhaps a, a little bit of blue too. I'm picking up some of the leftovers on the palette and looking for a value rather than as much as anything else, trying to tone it down, allow those leaves to kind of project themselves, leaving a bit of the underpainting coming through as though light is striking parts of the fence. And I know that after this dries, I'm going to return to that with uh, a division into the uh, the vertical parts of the fence to make it less of a uh, blocky nature and more of a fence um, quality. Well, here you see me play, placing some really strong darks, and I'm trying to think like a calligrapher. I'm trying to be very uh, calligraphic with the marks, a few brush strokes, leaving a few spots. This will really help to generate uh, the feeling that the light is coming from behind and uh, falling on our figures, creating a bat backlit scenario in terms of lighting. And at the same time, these sorts of uh, brush marks, I feel, create a vitality to the painting. They have their own strength regardless if it's a painting of a scene as I'm doing here or an abstract painting or um, Japanese Chinese calligraphy um, this sort of stroke kind of carries the artist's mind or artist's spirit and so I'm not going to adjust those I like the way that they finished I'm going to leave them as is I may add, uh, once this dries, some skinny lines to indicate pavers or something moving through the shadows. But I'm very pleased with the way that they um, formed on the bottom and how they complement uh, this kind of free-form chaotic energy above. Well, eventually we have to <clears throat> uh, move to our figures and uh, paint the figures. The figures, it's a tricky point because I want to certainly um, give enough information that you feel this is a, a male and a female dressed in kimonos um, standing in front of the fence. If I can do that without getting into too much detail, um, I'll be very pleased. <laughs> I've created a, a strong warm color where the figures will be, and I'm going to count on that warm color to come through in the final painting and uh, create a bit of glow. You can already feel that uh, as it's drying up above, uh, that yellow coming through everything and creating a, a sense, a sensation that light is passing through this these yellow and golden leaves and creating that that quality 
that quality of light, um, a glowing quality. And this is achieved, this is uh, one of watercolor's hallmarks, I feel, is being able to utilize that uh, transparent nature and we're utilizing the white of the paper too to come through that yellow and uh, as I said I feel it's a hallmark of watercolor and something that I try to um, emphasize in almost every painting okay putting on the obi putting on the kimono uh, creating the hair uh, there's also a umbrella and the male figure, the male kimono actually, is much less colorful. Just like in the West, we have a tuxedo. The, the kimono is striking in appearance. It's very uh, simple lines, beautiful lines. But uh, in the male figure, it's rather demure. In the female figure, they use a lot of color and a lot, uh, very often, golds and silvers in the, uh, in the obi. So the garments themselves are very often works of art. You can go to museums and they have examples from um, long ago that still have a strong color and a strong design. And those are important to the, to the artist. Uh, seeing those things enchants us while it may not be a major part of our painting. It's some, certainly something that we'd like to allude to, and I'm going to try and do that with a minimal amount of um, attention to detail. The danger is to um, follow that too closely, and you lose the the quality of the whole painting uh, if you key on one specific area too much. Um, so the there's a balance point, I guess is what you would call it, balancing the, the amount of detail and the use of color and the use of highlights to the whole painting. I, I'm constantly stepping back from this painting, observing it from about 10 feet, painting on it a little more, especially at this stage in the painting when you're finishing it. You want to I feel I have to stand back regularly and see the overall picture, see how these details are affecting the overall picture. Because in, to me, in the, in the final analysis, that's what really um, carries it. So you can see it's drying, and, and, and the, the, the underpainting that we did is coming through. Uh, we're seeing a nice uh, warm nature to all these colors. Even the the cool grays that we place later on have dried. And, and look at how the, her kimono is glowing under the parasol. I put this little circle here to show you uh, center of interest. Uh, the center of interest in this painting is a different distance from each side of the paper. So it's in a good place. It kind of catches our attention. The composition based on the cross and I also use some of these angles of the swooping yellows and, and shadows to guide the eye in this painting. Anyway, I hope it was useful to you and that it's something that uh, this technique is something that you'll use in your watercolors.